Good afternoon, and welcome to our opening program for Rewrite, Organize, Remix, Visions of Feminist Organizing. I'm Katrina Jackson, the Leah Jellin Porview Executive Director of the Schlesinger Library and Librarian of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. Rewrite, Organize, Remix presents the dynamic stories of groups, including community organizers, artists, students, and thinkers who mobilize to name and challenge injustice and achieve liberation. Rewrite, Organize, Remix illustrates how people convene to define themselves and their experiences and create networks of allies for economic support and social capital. As the program speakers will discuss, the exhibition presents materials from the archives that speak both to the solidarity of past movements and moments and to the possibility of inspired change within our own lives. The exhibition is open from Mondays through Fridays, 9 a.m. to 4 p. 30 p.m. from today, April 1st through October 11th. It is free and open to the public and registration is recommended. Further information about visiting Radcliffe's exhibitions is provided on the website. Joining us today are speakers Emily Drabinsky, President of the American Library Association and Associate Professor of Queens College Graduate School of Library and Information Studies. Tanu Yakapateage, multidisciplinary artist and climate justice and immigrants rights advocate. Emma Mosa Shaw, lead curator of Rewrite, Organize, Remix, and reference librarian at Schlesinger Library. The exhibition webpage provides links to the full bios of the speakers, and we will post that link in the chat during the program. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and our annual donors who are watching this afternoon. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. We also want to gratefully acknowledge the Helen Blumen and Jan Acton Fund for Schlesinger Library Exhibitions for their support of this exhibition. We encourage you to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions at any time during the program, and we will address as many as we can. Since we anticipate a lot of questions, we ask that you keep them short. This will enable us to address as many as possible in the time we have. Please keep an eye on the chat feature of the webinar where we will post the link to register to view the exhibition or to schedule a group or class tour. It is now my pleasure to pass the virtual floor over to the curator of this exhibition, my colleague, Mimosa Shaw. Thank you so much, Katrina. I am excited to present to you Rewrite, Organize, Remix, Visions of Feminist Organizing. It's an exhibit whose roots stretch back to when I first started working at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute in October, 2022. Before I continue, I would like to give special thanks to my immediate library exhibit committee members. They include librarian archivist for digital program, Zachary Majorana, archivist and metadata specialist, Paula Aloisio, associate director, Ellen Shea, and executive assistant, John Jail. Additional support from curator of gender and society, Jenny Gottwals, also helped make this exhibit come to its full fruition. And of course, my gratitude goes to colleagues in academic ventures and engagement, including Jen Burkett, Joe Zane, Caitlin Rubin, and Meg Ratzel for their efforts to keep us aligned with the schedule. Mimeograph leaflets, handmade flyers, newsletters, special edition magazines, dog-eared and passed around at clandestine basement meetups, potlucks, and barbecues and coffee houses. These are just a few of the items that began to catch my attention as I started research on diverse community organizers and movement builders at the Schlesinger Library. 
What makes the unique infrastructure of organizing possible? What networks of information gathering and mutual aid had to happen? And more importantly, what kinds of efforts led to them getting built? So often, popular history takes for granted the nitty gritty details that ground our ideals and dreams. We can take lessons from alternate and or underrepresented histories about how they organized and how they learned about themselves in the process. African-American lesbian feminist and poet, Pat Parker has a series of papers at the Schlesinger Library. And these documents became a guide star for me as I considered how to share the stories that ultimately became Rewrite, Organize, Remix. Here's a brief excerpt from a speech she gave in August 1980 to the Black Women's Revolutionary Council and other local grassroots organizers in Oakland, California. The reality is that revolution is not a one-step process. You fight, you win, it's over. It takes years. Long after the smoke of the last gun has faded away, the struggle to build a society that is classless, that has no traces of sexism and racism in it, will still be going on. And the other illusion is that revolution is neat. It's not neat or pretty or quick. It is a long, dirty process. Parker goes on to talk about her various identities and how she struggles to be seen as a Black woman, as a lesbian, as a member of the working class. And it's this thread of intersectionality that's picked up by others whose collections are on display in the exhibit. For instance, lawyer, civil rights activist, and Episcopalian minister Polly Murray raised similar questions about her identities in communications with other founding members of the National Organization for Women during its activation throughout the late 1960s and early 1970s. Woven throughout Rewrite, Organize, Remix are various examples of how people convened, learned about and created and articulated unique terminologies to define who they were and their experiences and what they did to create networks of allies and co-conspirators. I'm excited that we can highlight materials from our many rich collections, including from the papers of Pat Parker, Polly Murray, as well as organizers like Vivian Rothstein, Yolanda Vaco, and Leanne Irwin. And we also feature items from the records of Call Off Your Tired Old Ethics, also known as Coyote, an organization dedicated to providing support and liberation for sex workers, and the Harvard Union for Clerical and Technical Workers, HUCTW. Before I let this get too deep, let me remind you, there are absolutely moments of immense joy documented here. Picnics at the park, parties at the beach, soirees with disco pizzazz, fundraising cartoons featuring artists like Ani DeFranco and Michelle Mendege Ocello, elaborate costume balls. These are also on display in the exhibit and together they highlight the love, acts of solidarity, disagreements, and moments of hope that enabled community organizers to uphold their momentum. Today, I'm eager to chat with my two esteemed panelists, librarian, educator, and American Library Association President Emily Dabrinsky, as well as activist, multimedia artist, Tanu Yakupitake, about how they create and sustain movements for social change. Welcome, and thank you. So I'd like to get started with a few questions. One of the first cases for the exhibit features items from the records of the Harvard Union of Clerical and Technical Workers. Inside, there's a letter from the Harvard Medical School employee, Martha Rob. She writes to her supervisor, Vivian Mubeski, about a personal leave request so that she can devote herself full time to, quote, bringing about a union at Harvard. This letter dates back to 1984. That's almost four years before the successful creation of their union. Emily, what inspired you to become an organizer and advocate for library and archival workers? And what were some of your first wins for labor? And how much time and resources did that involve? Thank you for the question, Mimosa. And I want to start by saying congratulations on just an extraordinary accomplishment with this exhibit. I actually can't think of a more important conversation for us to be having right now uh, other than the one of 
how literally technically do we make the kind of change we want to see in the world and i think uh especially for those of us who have been uh thinking and working for uh social justice and and you and i are out of the library fields we've been doing that for a while we all see that there are problems that need to be addressed and the question now is well what is the nitty gritty stuff that we need to do to get it done. And I, I appreciate the focus of the exhibition and I'm thrilled that you're bringing it to such a wide audience. I, uh, you know, I did, I never thought of myself as an organizer until I had to become one. So I think embedded in your question is, uh, and I think in a lot of the stories that we have about people who do things in the world, there's a, a sense that maybe you thought about it for a long time and then decided to take action. And I think that's actually not how things work. And I'll be interested in the conversation uh, this afternoon. I didn't become involved in the labor movement until I had to be. I was working as a faculty librarian at Long Island University's Brooklyn campus, uh, where at the end of a contract negotiation, we were locked out by our employer. Uh, a lockout is when uh, instead of the workers going on strike, management fires everybody in an effort to get the people in the unit to sign the contract and agree to what's been offered um so that's not it's a like a very material experience so i found out on a you know on a wednesday that as a friday i would no longer have a salary i would not have health insurance i would uh not be allowed on campus access to my email was blocked our uh, online course sites were, uh, they, they blocked us from logging into like our Blackboard accounts and put uh, people that they had hired uh, from the internet to come in and teach our classes or they repurposed administrators to teach our classes for us. And it was the kind of thing where I just, I could have read about it in a book or talked to somebody who it happened to and that would have been one thing, but having something like that happen to you. Um, or to live in a in a world or in a body or in a place or a time where what's happening to you is intolerable. I think that's what produces activists, organizers. Um, and that's definitely what happened to me, which is not to say that I hadn't been like sort of doing a petition about styrofoam at the yogurt store in high school. Like I definitely had a tendency, but uh, it was really the circumstances of my life that produced uh, my commitment to organizing as a way of both thinking about the world and of uh, thinking about social change. Your question about time is an interesting one um, because it's all all the time. I think when you're organizing around something that you care about that is about uh, whether or not you're going to be able to live the the idea of a uh, work life balance kind of goes out the window a little bit um but i think it's important to uh like what are the things that took all my time i'll give you some concrete examples so we had a uh, uh, an action plan and this is back in 2016 we had an action plan where we wanted faculty who had been locked out to join us all together at a coffee shop we were going to sign everybody up for um uh, unemployment insurance and just like stick together so that we weren't fractured because when we're thinking about social change we're thinking about building movements we're thinking about pulling people together and keeping them that way uh, so how do you get a bunch of people to show up at the coffee shop it's not a flyer on Facebook it is a spreadsheet with the names of everybody in it it is everybody's phone number it is a separate spreadsheet with the names of everybody who's going to call those people. And then it's assessments and another sheet of what those people said when we called and asked if they were going to come to the, and someone has to reserve the space and someone has to think about refreshments and who's going to, are we going to have a bag check and who's going to help the people sign up? Because as those of you in the audience who are librarians and know, not everybody knows how to fill out an online form and it often falls to you. Uh, and so all of those little pieces is both work and when we are organizing together for something that we care about, it's also joy. So uh, it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of time spent with comrades and colleagues and friends who care about what you care about, which I think uh, softens the the sense that your your time is gone. So during that, I found out that like what I really love is organizing people and getting people together. It's like my passion now. I've got everything that I do trying to get people together. It's the ALA Library. Uh, American Library Association President's Project is to get more of us involved in the association, more of us committed to each other, more of us showing up for each other, uh, and that's a lot of work. 
I could go into some of the victories, but they're partial and technical. Uh, but the biggest victory is that I've got a whole lot of people all across the country who I know agree with me and share my uh, political analysis. And there's only one way to get that. And that's by talking to people one on one, face to face, over the phone constantly. Um, and for me, that's what gives my life meaning. Wow, thank you. That's really inspirational. Thank you for going into the nitty gritty details. That's exactly what we're talking about here. And in fact, if there ever was somebody to go in and archive your particular works, they would have to go in and probably do a snapshot of some of those things that you talked about. You have to download a lot of spreadsheets. It's not gonna be visually appealing. <laughs> no, but, uh, but that's, 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 that's the dirty ground work that it takes. And, and Tanu, your career as an activist and change maker for diverse causes, such as immigrant rights, sustainability, and climate change accountability, and LGBTQ rights have led you to different places and spaces to learn from and observe other organizers. How do you bring that organizing understanding back to your work on the ground wherever you are based? Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Such an honor to be um, amongst y'all and librarians who are super critical. I don't think I would be who I am without um, librarians who showed me the way. And also librarians are very much under attack right now. So um, really recognizing also just the importance of the kind of knowledge base, um, particularly in, a, in, a, in an environment where, you know, in some states of librarians even, um, offer young people books about LGBTQ youth, they could potentially be arrested. Um, and that's the kind of legislation that's going through. So just wanting to note that. Um, but to answer your question, Mimosa, I think um, I need to give some, some context to my background. Um, so I, um, I was really politicized as a, um, as a teenager. Um, I was in, to age myself, I was in high school when 9-11 um, happened. I grew up um, in Sri Lanka and Thailand. Um, I moved to the U.S. when I was 18 for college, and fun fact, I went to Hampshire College and actually took classes with Emily's brother, uh, John Draminski, who and a lot of those professors were a part of my sort of, um, you know, political formation. Um, but, you know, I think for me, being a young brown person um, growing up in Asia when 9-11 happened, and, you know, I, I went to um, a high school, with primarily kids from all over Asia who had these, like, you know, aspirations to go to different parts of the West. And, um, you know, when 9-11 happened for a lot of us, we were like, oh, wow, like this is this is really going to change things. And it did. Um, for those of us who did come to um, colleges or universities in the U.S., um, you know, we went through major background checks. Um, my friends who were Muslim and South Asian and, and Middle Eastern, for example, had it, had it even worse, I would say. Um, yeah, the first couple of years of my um, life in the US, um, I was only granted one year visas at a time and I had to always leave in order to um, renew my visa to come back. And so it all ended up being a class game of like who could actually afford to to come to the US to um, to study. Um, so I think the, that that sort of I was always interested in human rights, but the context of 9-11 really, um, you know, impacted me as like a young woman of color. And, um, you know, I, I went to Hampshire College and um, many of you might know it's a pretty hippie school, no grades, um, very political. And that that place really um, politicized me and like taught me how to um, an, a theory around organizing. And also just like I, I really started to learn and embed myself in, you know, understanding um, the context of organizing in the U.S., um, and uh, when I was um, when I'm in within my first six months um, in the U.S., a friend um, who was an immigrant rights organizer took me to um, asked if I wanted to come to a major immigrant rights rally um, that was happening um, in New York at the time. And this was 2003. And that's how I sort of started to get involved um, with immigrant rights and started to really understand um, uh, the plight of undocumented young people, but undocumented folks in general. There's about 11 million plus undocumented folks living in the United States. So um, after uh, college and then and grad school, I ended up working at the New York Immigration Coalition, 
Um, I was a communication strategist there and eventually became the director of communications. And um, I, my, my tool related to what Emily was saying, because, you know, organizing looks like lots of different things. For me, my tool around organizing was media strategy, um, you know, making sure that like we were really seeding a narrative around like, you know, very basic things like immigrants deserve um, to, to, to thrive that, you know, regardless of your immigration status, you should have access to basic health care, to language access. Um, and I also worked on a pathway to citizenship as well. Um, this was during the Obama years. Um, and I, I think that was sort of a, a way for me to get into lots of different kinds of movements. I was also very involved in Occupy Wall Street um, when that happened. I was like 26 when Occupy was uh, happening. So I was pretty involved in that and really trying to connect an immigrant rights framework into um, work around economic justice in general. Um, and so to your question uh, around how I bring an understanding back to my work, um, I mean, one, one thing I'll say is that these issues aren't separate from me. I'm an immigrant. Um, at the same time as I was working um, on immigrant rights, like I myself was, um, um, you know, on visas. Um, I'm a U.S. citizen now, but it took um, almost 20 years. Um, and it was a really huge struggle. And I'm someone with privilege. You know, I'm someone who went to these like fancy American international schools in Asia, was able to come here, um, you know, and and eventually shift statuses. But um during my time working in the, the New York Immigration Coalition, I was working with primarily undocumented youth at the same time as I was also trying to figure out my own stuff. Um, but the one thing that I think has always inspired me through all of the sort of different kinds of organizing work I've done is just like the power of youth, because young people are so bold and um, they are not confined. And so one of the my, my experience um, doing immigrant rights work was um, working with a lot of young people, this was before deferred action for childhood arrivals was even a thing. So working with incredible young people who are advocating for themselves, who, um, you know, were, have, had lived in the U.S. from age two, three, four, five, um, and um, weren't able to apply for um, financial aid because of their status, because sometimes they would realize their status or learn about their status as teenagers. Um, and so I, I felt like it was a real honor to be part of a movement that was really at the time, like, um, really shifting a narrative on immigration. And, you know, in some ways we're seeing rollbacks on that. And, and it's really interesting. I recently talked to um, a bunch of um, folks who I came up with in the immigrant rights movement, and they're all artists, like people like Julio Salgado and Fabiana Rodriguez. I'm sure everyone knows of those big, beautiful, like butterfly posters um, that say immigrant rights are human rights, or Julio Salgado, who um, was one of the first young people who was both queer and undocumented to start like making all of these this be beautiful artwork about being undocu queer, for example. And so it's like, it, it feels... Um, kind of bizarre to be in this moment in 2024 where it really feels like something has snapped back and we're back in a place where we're having to rebuild a narrative around immigration. Um, I moved into climate work in 2017 um, after uh, Trump, the, the Trump presidency, one of my, um, the, one of the last projects, one of the last um, pieces of work at the coalition before I moved over, but was still um, doing work on immigration was around the Muslim ban. So I was one of the main organizers for the JFK uh, Muslim ban protests. Um, and and it, it looked exactly what, like in terms of what it means to mobilize and organize people, it was a combination of absolutely using social media, but literally calling people on lists, getting things out over networks. Um, I chose to move into um, climate justice partially because I, as an immigrant myself, just like I, I needed I needed a minute <laughs> to really sort of figure out my own stuff. But also, I think after um, Trump became president, I, I really also thought about how um, we need to be working across silos because at the time it felt like a lot of issue areas were siloed. It was LGBTQ rights over here, immigrant immigrant rights over here, climate justice over here. And, um, you know, when it comes to uh, the climate movement, um, it, like I at the time and, and still like I really think that like, you know, it's the, the most impacted people, people from the global south. Um, you know, young black and brown people who really need to be paving the way in the climate justice movement. 
And um, a lot of bigger greens, um, frankly, weren't really that diverse. Um, and so I wanted to bring more of an immigrant justice perspective into climate work, particularly because the climate crisis um, is, uh, you know, it's going to cause, ma cause mass migration. And the majority of that migration is actually from the global south. And it's because of fossil fuel companies. It's because of what the West, places like the US, Europe, have done over, you know, a hundred years of industrialization where the those most impacted by the climate crisis um, are people living in places like the Pacific Islands, Bangladesh, I'm, I'm Sri Lankan, the Maldives is right next to Sri Lanka, like that's, that's going to sink basically by 2050. Um, and so my work over um, six years, uh, I worked at 350.org, which is um, the organization that Bill McKibben started, um, was really around um, narrative shifting and mobilizing people for massive um, climate rallies. Um, I'm sure folks know about the People's Climate March. Um, I started to get involved from 2017, but I ha had been involved as an organizer for the 2014 March. And again, when it comes to archiving, like so many of these mo moments and movements, um, art uh, was such a huge part of it. Um, There's was, there was cultural organizing and a lot of these archives that Mimosa is talking about is such a key part of how you mo mobilize people to action. Um, so in terms of just, um, I, I would say just a couple of lessons I've learned is like, we need to stop siloing issue areas. And that's also very clear right now, I would say. And we need to show up across issue areas. And um, I, I do, do a lot of work on a just transition which is this idea that um, we say it a lot in climate and environmental justice work, where those most impacted by um, the issues have to be part of the solutions. And so um, when it comes to how do I bring understandings of all of this back to my work, um, currently um, I run a, a BIPOC climate justice portfolio at a foundation, um, and it's really focused on supporting front lines, climate justice, environmental justice work, housing and land justice. And so in this particular role where I'm really supporting, um, you know, broader movements all across the country, um, I really lead with the philosophy that in terms of like these positions of power and privilege, we really need to um, bring people to the table and we need to be prioritizing those most impacted in terms of what the solutions look like. Thank you, Tanu. That was really remarkable, all the ways that you illustrated how you became involved, how you gradually learned about different people and their different struggles, how you were able to uh, learn from other activists, particularly those who are younger. And then of course, uh, your current work, um, mobilizing others who are on the front lines of climate justice. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Emily, a uh, question now about uh, the archivalness of what we are featuring, although we do feature books as well. So Rewrite Organized Remix features letters and notes from people who didn't realize how their words or their actions would be perceived today. Emily, how does one archive liberation moments and what messages what might we glean now from such archives as Tanu alluded to earlier? It's a great question and I feel ill-equipped to answer it, not being an archivist and being someone who throws things away. Like just this weekend, I was like cleaning the shelf and was like, do I need these diaries? No. Um, before I answer though, I did wanna say one thing to um, in response to what Tony shared that like the people who are most impacted need to be at the front of the movement and making the decisions. And I think sometimes, uh, we imagine that that's for a moral or ethical reason, but it's really because the people who are most impacted know what the problem is and know what they need. Um, and it, so part of the project for me inside of ALA right now is to talk to as many library workers as I can and to make sure that those are the stories that are guiding my actions. And I think that's super important. So I just wanted to like agree strongly uh, with that. In terms of archiving liberation movements, I, I mean, I think your exhibition is a really good example of why it's so important. Because and it's not that um, those who don't learn from their history are doomed to repeat it. Like, I don't think it's that like uh, pat, but I do think that we have things to learn from one another that are embedded in exactly the kinds of uh, 
ephemeral materials that are people talking to one another and what are they saying to one another, right? And I think um, who's talking to who is important as we're thinking about how to build movements and how to organize. I, I like to say I or, try to organize with organized people, right? So for me, when I'm looking at history of social movements, or I'm looking for at, at sort of the movements I'm involved in now and where I see action happening, I want to look at the relationships. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can glean from uh, collections from liberation movements. Who's talking to who and about what, right? That uh, the need to break out of silos, as you said, Tanu, I think is so crucial and so important. And one of the things I think about a lot, like to what extent is the organized movement against book bans that I'm a part of at the American Library Association, how is that connected? to uh, climate justice, how is that connected to immigrant rights? I think that there are stories that we could tell there that would make the library as a formation, as an institution with resources in it, with people in it, um, more imp impactful, right? Like that word that we are sort of sick of hearing, but I think can make the, the fight for against book bans to be a fight on behalf of public institutions more broadly, the public good more generally, and the fight for what libraries represent, which is equitable access to information and resources for everyone. And so any move, social movement that would be involved and interested in that, right? Like equity, equitable distribution of resources. And I think that's most social movements. If we can make those connections, I think it's really important. So I'm thinking about just this conversation that we're having right now. How would we archive that? How would we uh, say that the conversations that, that we're gonna generate in the next, uh, over the, the rest of this time together. And then, and because I'm a librarian and I always come back to this, how are we ever gonna find it after we collect it? And so I think this, the, that what's really important in the sort of how does one archive, one both offers an institutional infrastructure that has resources in it so that we can save things. And then crucial is making sure that we have those archives staffed by trained, uh, workers, library and archives workers who are supported and sustained in such a way that they can both do the incredibly important work of description, which we know is crucial to access, but maybe our bosses don't always know that, and to make sure that we have the people who can connect users to the information. And so putting uh, library and archives workers at the center of any preservation uh, strategy, I think is really important. So I'll, I'll end on that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. Uh, I know that we don't have that much time left and we have a couple more questions to go. But um, Danu, you've already described a little bit about how you advocate for the causes you're passionate about, including your work um, in communications. But if you'd like to uh, talk a little more about that and other things that you do in your advocacy. That was such a broad question. Um, I mean, I... You know, I also have complicated feelings about social media, but I use social media and social media is not the end all be all. Like, I think that um, there's a there's a thing that people mix up now where just just because you're advocating for something on social media, does that mean you're an activist? Like, does that mean you're an organizer? And I would say no, that doesn't. And so there are times I think I'm an organizer and there are times when I'm not. I'm just an advocate who cares and is passionate about certain issues. Um but you know, I'll speak to um, recent work I've been doing. I've been involved in New York-based and neighborhood-based um, organizing work um, in solidarity with Palestine. Um, I, in my neighborhood, um, I live in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. I've been um, part of a group of um, um, uh, neighbor, like neighborhood folks, mothers, families who have been pushing um, their electeds, electeds to call a ceasefire. And what started as five or six people um, outside of Congresswoman Yvette Clark's office is now thousands of people. Um, and we did that through um, mobilizing our friends, creating email lists, creating social media, and being part of a broader movement that is really trying to unsilo issues because um, for me, as um, someone who's worked on climate justice, as someone who's worked on immigrant rights, who's someone, as someone who's queer and who cares about LGBTQ rights, these are not separate issues from, for example, what's happening in Palestine, um, what's happening in other parts of the global south. And so I feel very, very 
um, adamant and passionate about connecting those dots because we all deserve liberation. None of us are free until we are all free. And so that is really my philosophy around everything that I advocate for. Um, like yesterday, for example, was Trans Day of Visibility. Um, you know, I'm I'm a cis woman, at, but I, I am in community. I'm in queer community in New York with, you know, folks who are gender nonconforming, who are trans. And so I make sure that I am like one of the most, like the loudest, most vocal advocates for trans um, folks, because I think that a lot of cis people need to need to be. We can't be silent around these issues or, you know, whisper our support. And I really try to be a person who um, really is connecting the dots. Um, if anyone's interested, Climate Justice Alliance has an incredible webinar called um, Palestine is a Climate Justice is Issue, um, where they really talk about um, militarism, uh, the impact of um, war globally uh, on emissions. And, you know, right now I, you know, I, I'm doing work that's really on the intersection of housing and land and climate and environmental justice. And so for me, all of that shows up in work um, around, you know, advocating for basic human rights for Palestinians, just as it shows up uh, for me as a Sri Lankan um, around how I um, push back against my own government that has created a lot of um, um, rifts between people of different ethnicities. Um, and so I don't know if that answers your question, um, Mimosa, around um, how I, um, advocate for things but um yeah I really see a distinction between like you know social media as a platform and organizing um and you know I really encourage people sometimes the best ways to organize are to do it locally um to do it in your communities to do it you know like Emily is doing um you know with librarians um because like otherwise it can feel really overwhelming thank you for explaining and thank you for sharing all the ways that you strategize and work with so many people. Um, oftentimes people say organizing, but we think about um, what are the specific actions involved with that and you illustrated that perfectly. Uh, I wanted to just quickly ask Emily, how have your diverse experiences informed the way you advocate for others? And, um, and if you could share just a little bit about that um, process, please. Sure. And, you know, I'm taking a look at the Q&A as we're talking, and I see a question here about whether a librarian or archivist can avoid the appearance of politicization. So I'm going to wrap that into this response. I think, uh, you know, advocating for a particular end is one thing. And sometimes I'm doing that. Like, I want all of us to do the same thing. When I'm trying to think of, like, an example. It's been a little while. But, like, I want, well, I want, uh mm, I'm going to think of a of an I, I like to think of sort of silly examples because I think that's easier. So uh, back at LIU, in addition to getting locked out, I used some uh, of I used some money that I got from the library to purchase a toaster oven for the library break room, and I wanted us to have access to a toaster because it's fun to gather together around a new appliance and work can sometimes be boring, but also it was just like good to have uh, a toaster. But it took some it took some organizing because there was also a, a strain in the library of people who uh, believed that a toaster might explode and was dangerous and we shouldn't have one in the break room. And so I was trying to organize people to come with me on the idea that a toaster would be a good thing to add to the break room. Um, and so that when I'm at, like, rather than advocating for people, I'm advocating with people, right? Like, I know that a toaster is good. And I've talked to enough people that we all agree on this. And now I'm trying to get everybody to come with me so that nobody like vetoes the toaster. So that's one form of advocacy work that we do when we know exactly where we're going. Another one, the one that I think that we're all engaged in more often than that, if we're being honest, is just trying to pick up a little piece of something here that might make it a little bit better if we maybe did one of these things. And so I think if we think of organizing as a, a sort of a temporary sort of alignment of energy and interest and forces around a particular thing, that's a formation that doesn't have to last forever, but is just really about the thing that we decide is important right now. It releases some of the tension of like, I've got to figure out exactly what to do next that will be the right thing. And instead I can be like, well, we all agree that a kid should be able to read a book when they come to the library. And, and that's not a, a partisan claim or a political claim. That is just a claim about like, 
do we value that? Is that a thing that we want in the world? We want children to be able to read books, right? Um, and when we see places where that's not happening, we're going to organize around that. Some of the most effective organizing work I've seen in my sort of year as ALA president, looking at parts of the country where people are doing this really successfully, it's in communities where it didn't take people agreeing about everything. It just took people agreeing about the, the book ban. So I'm really inspired by the organizing that's happening right now in Louisiana, which is like the one of the worst states in the in the country for adverse legislation affecting libraries. And some of the actions that I've seen there have involved uh, faith communities uh, alongside the queer community, two communities that sometimes you see in tension, all agreeing that the library is worth saving and worth organizing around. One of the most effective ad advocates in Louisiana and most effective organizers, Lynette Meha, who is just fantastic and does amazing work uh homeschools right like she's not a librarian she's a mom in the community who believes in the library and believes in it and so i think thinking about it less as advocating for a giant program and more organizing you know that's important and we need that but one of the things i've learned is that once i'm in a space where like the big umbrella we all agree with kids should be able to read then it's about finding and making connections with people on the ground around particular issues and problems and that question of is that political work, making sure that our tent is broad enough and that we're really focused on material outcomes, um, I think can save us from some of that because it's you don't it's not a partisan issue whether or not uh, we should have a library in our community. That's something that we I think can all agree on. Thank you. Um, all right, then uh, I have one last question before we. Um, transition to a slideshow of what the exhibit looks like um, is, you know, what do you both do to cultivate joy and um, care in these times of strife and struggle? And I'd love to hear from you, Thanu, first quickly. Um, and I know you've done some incredible artistry, magic happening with happenings. And I'd love if you could share with us some of that work. And then Emily as well. Thank you. Sure. I mean, joy is such a huge part of my practice, um, along with sort of the work I do as um, an activist, media strategist, um, sort of program advocate. Um, I'm also a DJ. <laughs> um, and this has been like a huge part of um, on my life for the last 10 plus years. And I think some sometimes people are like, oh, that's fun. You know, that seems that's a fun, fickle thing. But for me, it's actually really, really connected to my organizing um it for me DJing um and creating spaces primarily queer spaces um you know throwing fundraisers um for you know various issues whether trans rights or Palestine um is a way of bringing people into the community and a, a different way of um really connecting to issues and doing it through music. Um, the way I DJ is about, um, is about um, really thinking about stories and like migration. Um, I like to genre blend um, across different kinds of music that um, is based in the global South. Um, and cause you know, my, my whole philosophy is like, why do we do any of this work? Whether it's like advocating um, for climate justice or um, advocating for, you know, civil rights or um you know whatnot it's really because we all deserve to thrive and for me thriving means that we need to create spaces of joy um and just the last thing i'll share is um another thing that i um uh, something that i went to recently um that was really inspiring for me uh was at the people's forum um this uh, group uh called artists against apartheid uh, um had an event where um, they had an incredible artist. Her name is Samia Halabi. She's a Palestinian American abstract painter. Um, she's in her 80s. Um, her retrospective uh, of work at Indiana University was recently canceled because of her um, support um, for her peoples. And she was in conversation with Nellie Hester Bailey, who um, is the in her 80s as well, um, executive director of the Harlem Tenants Council. Um, she came up through the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and um, to watch these two women in their 80s, connecting it back to feminism and archives was just incredibly inspirational and joyful for me to watch these women who were talk who are rooted in civil rights, Black Lives Matter, housing work, and, you know, work around, um, you know, displacement and um, 
you know, land justice for communities in Palestine and doing it through art and activism, talking to each other. Um, and this room was like packed with primarily young people. And that to me was such a, a beautiful moment of like transferring of archival history. Um, and there was a party after, so it really all connected. So I just, um, that, those are all the ways in which I, I try to like bring joy and creativity and also learn from the many, many people um, before me who um, have been thinking about these issues. I'll keep it really short. I read every day, I write every day, and I watch Major League Baseball. So those are things like they're my core, they're things that I care about, go Dodgers. So making sure that you take care of your core things before you do anything else. And laugh, get a friend who laughs with you. Thank you, Emily and Thanu for sharing. Um, right now we're going to transition to a slideshow and this will illustrate the things that are in the exhibit itself. Thank you so much okay. for sharing that um, slideshow. And of course, I would like to switch over to the Q&A. And at this moment, I will be taking um, the time to address some of the questions that were put forth by some of our audience members here. Um, so let's go ahead. Um, and one of our attendees who chose to remain anonymous asked, activism sometimes needs perhaps risky tactics that are best left undocumented. Action can be messy and misinterpreted. How to balance this with the desire to document an archive for historical understanding? I mean- Do you wanna I'll, start? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly we can't have cameras in everybody's faces, but there's different ways of archiving, I think. And some of it is just through narrative storytelling. Um, 
And, and so I think, you know, the role of archiving for me isn't necessarily, I mean, it's the, the um, safety of activists is primarily the most important. And so um, I think it's really about being really clear about what consent looks like, like what are the strategies of an action? Um, and then within an action being clear what can be documented and archived and what maybe can't be. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Emily. Yeah, and you know, I think uh, we can't save everything, right? And so anytime we're in an archive, we're looking at a, a little selection. And I think the messiness of activism, and you're totally right, like in, in you know, I have friends who are organizing in the city right now and they don't, there is no no trace, right? Like all of the organizing is doing is happening like person to person, um, you know, so understand, but I think it's important to understanding the movement archive as also one constructed under the constraints, right? Of what it was possible uh, to even say and write down. Thank you. Um, the next question I will go forth is, um, so some political scientists, have critiqued social movement organizing as overly informal in the pursuit of egalitarianism. That can lead to fizzling out and also to power imbalances from strong personalities. Can we make an egalitarian ethos both durable and internally fair? And I'll we'll let Emily go and then Tammy. I mean, I think. It, it depends, right? I think it's very challenging. It's very challenging to organize anything, right? Like I think about even trying to, like you could describe my family somewhat similarly, right? Uh, a lot of power imbalances and strong personalities, I think. Uh, but I do think the durability of institutions is important. I think about my own organizing is happening through and uh, within existing institutions, because I think institution building is really challenging. Uh, and so I think more than anything, infrastructure is what we really need. And I'm uh, continually uh, inspired and motivated by projects where the infrastructure is at the heart of it. I think of the, um, a good example is the Sylvia Rivera Law Project here in New York City, which is a um, organizing and uh, uh, like a, a group that fights for trans rights that is uh, led by people from the community and is uh, has all the pieces in place for making the organization the kind of world we would want to inhabit, right? Like everybody makes a living wage, wages are the same across the board. Like it's got a lot of the things baked into the institution that I think uh, that's that infrastructure is sort of what makes it uh, durable. And it gives you somewhere to go if you want to make a change, you want to organize for, for a change. I do think though that movements do need leaders they do need people who can inspire people I think that that's um but that leader like what they can do has to be fairly like narrowly understood right that like the person who can uh get everybody shouting and crying is probably not the same person who can get those people to actually show up so having a a, a richer understanding of everything that goes into a movement I think for those of us who are trying to be a part of them um seeing that like there are multiple kinds of formations that are important and different kinds of tasks and uh but you do you do need somebody with some energy and enthusiasm I think that's not uh, untrue yeah I mean I think that there's different different kinds of social movements you know and like you know I think that there's you know there's certainly nonprofit organizations that are part of social movements and there's also an importance i think for different kinds of formations and also to emily's point like right now i would say that in in movement organizations there's a lot of unionizing happening because this idea that just because you care about an issue and you consider yourself an organizer and an activist and you shouldn't make a living wage is ridiculous like in all of these organizations that like any sort of like philosophy on that is changing people need like need health care they need they need a living wage they need to be able to um be able to take care of themselves and their families in order to do that work um and i'll also say that there there are times when you know overtly formal um organizations nonprofits etc can't necessarily move the needle the way that um like broader social movements can um, and so that's why these moments, whether it's Occupy Wall Street, whether it's like the, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, 
um, whether, you know, this current moment um, where a lot of folks are organizing around Palestine, these are trigger moments that help to shift narratives and to really help move people um, in, a, in a direction. And it's also the role of organizers and organizations to be able to really be on the pulse and really understand like, okay, this is what people care about. How do we help mobilize people in a, a in a direction for for the kind of social justice that we um, that we want, and so it, there's a I think there's a play between those two. And burnout is real. I have been burned out many a time um, in my life, and it really is around like how do you strike a balance for yourself as someone who's trying to do this work, and also recognize that none of this work can be done alone. It has to be done in community with other people. Okay, um, we have time for one last question. And we're gonna go ahead and um, let's see, a question that was just asked. Are we seeing a new rebirth of the labor trade unionization after 50 years of evisceration or will this be momentary? Uh, can you ask this question in 10 years, maybe? <laughs> I do think, um, right, like there's no way to see the future, but I will say that I see more people talking about the value of unions in a workplace than I have for my entire life. Uh, and you see sectors organizing that I never would have guessed would organize, like uh, Waffle, the, the current work happening in Waffle House workers in the South is inspiring. Uh, you have, uh, but like, you also have to look at who's been put in charge of the NLRB, right? And that like, we do have a favorable uh, federal picture for unions that I don't know that we're gonna have in November, you know, or in January, 2025, right? So, um, but I think we see a lot of energy. And so the task for those of us who are movement builders and organizers, the task is to take that energy and uh, organize it so that it doesn't, because I, you know, another question that someone has asked is what about successes and failures? Isn't coping with failure a key lesson? Well, there's a lot of failure. There's a lot of losing in movement work. There's a lot of winning too, but I don't know, Tanya, if you would agree that you, there, you just, failure is a daily practice, right? And so figuring out a way um, to lead with, to, 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 to organize around that anyway, so that you don't have people who uh, organize a union and then find that there's nothing automatic about having one and that it continued organizing is like how we're going to live our lives forever, right? That that is part of like the mindset shift is that uh, we're not going to do this until we're done, that this is the work of life, um, which I don't, it sounds dramatic, but it's like, do, you know, it's so much better than uh, despair, uh, waking up every day, working towards uh something that resembles a hope that is like believable. Um, so I think it's an exciting moment. I think that if if we can capitalize on that energy, uh, the moment will go on longer. Yeah, I'll just add that um, my friend Morgan Basikis at Jewish Voice for Peace um, often says, um, action is the antidote to despair. Um, and I think that labor movements will continue to be extremely, extremely important. Um, for example, like, um, you know, some of the largest unions, United Electrical Workers, American Postal Workers, 1199, SEIU, SE, um, have all called for a ceasefire. Um, and I think that's that's major. Um, and it really shows the importance of unions. Um, workers, working class people are the ones who run this country. And so um, and labor is what runs this country. And so there's a lot, even if there are a lot of um you know failures um that kind of mass mobilization is how we will eventually win anything thank you thank you thanu and emily so much for your generous time and energies sharing your knowledges and your experiences with us today um and i also thank the audience for their terrific questions Registration to visit Rewrite Organize Remix's exhibition in the Porvu Gallery of the Schlesinger Library at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute is now open and can be accessed through the Radcliffe website, radcliffe.harvard.edu. This exhibition is free and open to the public Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. from now, April 1st through October 11th, 2024. Advanced registration is encouraged before visiting Radcliffe exhibitions. And finally, today's program has been recorded and will be posted in about a week. For information about upcoming Radcliffe programs and to see videos of past Radcliffe events, um, please check out radcliffe.harvard.edu. 
And thank you again for joining us today and take good care. Thank you.